Kevin, thank you so much for uh, joining me today. I'm really glad uh, you've taken the chance to sit down and, and have a chat with me. Yeah, it's my pleasure. It was super nice uh, chatting with you and uh, happy to talk photography. Anything else? Can't wait. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so it was actually uh, Lexi at AP Almanac that uh, was the avenue in which I, I became um, uh, familiar with your work. And uh, she she told me, uh, you've got to check out this guy, uh, Kevin. So I went and took a look, a look at your work. It's fantastic. I just I just love it. Uh, and um, uh, I, I thought I need to talk to this guy. So here we are. Um, now, one thing that kind of strikes me about your imagery uh, is, you know, you kind of find photographers, they differentiate their styles either, you know, you get the kind of more commercial, uh, polished sort of bold advertising type of look, or on the other end of the spectrum, you get more of a, you know, the editorial natural kind of kind of look. And what, what struck me about your photography is, is you seem to have mastered a bit of a hybrid between those two. Uh, not only are you kind of capturing both styles, but when you do them together you do them exceptionally well and uh, so anyway I'm, I'm I'm really intrigued by that and want to find out more about how you accomplish the look that you do and uh, yeah it's it's really an honor to, to chat with you so thanks awesome yeah happy to chat about that I'm glad you've noticed that about my work because that's probably something I've, I've tried to figure out for a while um, is the approach on how to shoot a space or a project or a room or a building or a hotel or whatever it is to appease the client, but to also try and put your own personal twist and flavor on it. Um, Cause there's certain clients where if, you know, I shoot a lot of editorial looking work, but there's certain clients that don't necessarily want or need that. If they plan on using it in big budget advertising or something like that, where they want a little bit more of a flashy look. Um, so finding a mix between those things, or just have, just having the range to, be able to shoot one way or another, I think is probably the the most powerful thing that you could have. And it's, it's, I wouldn't say I'm, I've perfected that. I mean, I'm always trying to figure out how to better shoot a, a space or a project just to fit the sort of needs of, and, and visual appeal of the client, but also kind of keep it within my editorial kind of background. Um, so I'm glad you noticed that because it's, it's hard. Well, that that brings up a, an interesting question. One that I like to ask a lot of photographers is: is do you find that you're adjusting your shooting style to the brand and the look of the client, or are you um, being hired for your specific look? Um, I would say I'm being hired for my specific look the majority of the time, and I try and keep pushing that as the the shoot goes on. Um, but I think figuring out some sort of like elasticity between keeping your own creative style and look and the reason why people are interested in your work in the first place and then reaching a level that they're maybe expecting or that they could benefit from and meeting somewhere in the middle, um, I think is, is, is the best route that you could go. But I would say that my, the way that I approach shooting spaces and the look and, and overall the feel of my images, which I think is the most important thing, um, is definitely why most of my clients have come to me, especially with interior design, which is, pretty um subjective gotcha so um just taking a step back i wonder if you can tell us a little bit about your history um i i saw that you it looks like you kind of started as an event nightclub photographer how, how did you yeah. make that transition uh i did yeah um i get i mean i guess i could i'll try and do a quick summary um i got into photography when i was really young when i was in high school i was like a freshman in high school so I mean, you could say 14 years old was sort of the beginning of me shooting photos. Uh, and I'm 30 now. So it's been quite a long uh, journey. But um, I, the majority of my career before I got into shooting interiors and architecture and luxury homes and whatever you want to call it under that umbrella, I uh, shot a lot of music. Um, and that kind of started when I was at the University of Arizona. That's where I went to college. I went there for journalism major. My mom is a freelance writer, journalist, copy editor, copywriter, has been her whole life. Um, and so she kind of gave those journalistic qualities into me. And so I went to the U of A, uh, which is two hours from Phoenix. It's in Tucson, Arizona. Um, so it's two hours from home where I grew up and went to the journalism school there. I worked 
at the student newspaper for three out of the four years that I was there, the Arizona Daily Wildcat, where I, that was kind of my first real professional or semi-professional experience. I only say semi-professional because I was still in college and was still a kid somewhat. <laughs> so uh learned a lot about how to actually just work as a professional or staff photographer there, which, which is experience that I've taken with me throughout my career, just about organization and, and scheduling and, and timeliness and setting expectations for shoots. And if I have to work with someone else, providing plenty of notes and figuring out how to ingest photos, call them properly, sort them out properly. It's all stuff I learned at student newspaper, which is really cool experience in retrospect. Um, but I'm a huge music fan, always have been. And I started shooting music when I was in college. I started shooting for electronic music blogs, um, which was in a period of time, which is about uh, 2013, 2012, which was like this golden era of electronic music kind of exploding in the United States and in Canada. Mm -hmm. And um, I found it really interesting. I mean, my friends were kind of, felt kind of at the center fold of it. Um, and so we got to, I got some cool opportunities with some electronic music blogs that were actually based right out of U of A to shoot some DJ shows, to shoot some stuff locally. And then I got some opportunities to shoot a couple of music festivals, which, um, I mean, I photographed the electric daisy carnival in Las Vegas, photographed ultra in Miami for them, which was really crazy. Uh, I photographed the EDM festival at the gorge in Washington uh called paradiso which was really fun and that uh, a lot of that stuff um kind of led me to believe that i could like i was really into shooting music it was super fun it kind of fit my personality type which is being able to be a sort of a fly on the wall and it kind of fit the photojournalistic uh i guess background that i built for myself because shooting concerts you're really shooting a live subject and you're not in control, essentially. So I, I really always liked capturing things as sort of a photojournalist fly on the wall perspective, as opposed to photo shoots that were very staged. Um, so I had a lot of fun with that. And then right uh, my junior year of college, I got an opportunity to go photograph and work in the nightlife industry in Barcelona, Spain, actually. Oh, cool. Which kind of set me up for where, what I would do after college. So um in the summer of 2013, lived out down there with a bunch of my buddies who were studying abroad. And we all kind of worked in this really big Spanish nightlife industry that involved Barcelona and also Barcelona is adjacent to the island of Ibiza, which is, you know, the headquarters of electronic music for basically ever. Um, so we had an unbelievable summer down there and I was only 21 years old. And when I came back, graduated UVA, Decided to come back to Scottsdale right away with my now wife, Courtney, because that was where I had the most connections. And that was where I had the, probably the most ability to just make money doing photography right out of college. If I had moved to another bigger market, it probably would have been harder because I already knew quite a lot of people in Arizona, which I think is super valuable to sort of milk the networking connections that you already have. Um, and that turned out really great. I ended up working for this nightclub in Old Town Scottsdale, which is another just massive nightlife industry uh, called My Day Nightclub. And that was right at like the precipice of when they were bringing in like the biggest DJs in the country, sort of like a Las Vegas, very much like a Las Vegas nightclub, big time DJ show every weekend type of scenario. And so I had tons of work, but I worked out like every night of every weekend. It was it was exhausting for sure. But um, that's kind of, and, and it, it was from there that I, trans I got an opportunity essentially to shoot real estate. And that's a whole nother long conversation into how I got into real estate and then to here. Yeah. But um, shooting music was really a really great learning experience and just so much fun to, to capture like the live energy and young people and music culture and sort of like this younger party culture when I was only 21, 22, 23 years old, you know, it's very like invigorating. Totally. Um, I honestly miss it a little bit too. 
Because it, it, it's like if if someone extended the hand and was like, "Hey, we need an extra hand at you know some music festival somewhere," I would I would get a little giddy, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, for sure. There was something I was passionate about too, because it was like I've always loved music, so being able to like work in and around it was really like priceless at the time, yeah. even though I was making nothing. Yeah, no, I totally get that. Um, if you ever make it up to British Columbia, you gotta check out Shambhala or uh, Base Coast. Those are. Oh, yeah, I've heard of those. Oh yeah. Where yeah. are you? Where are you in BC? Are you by? Uh, I'm in the town of uh, Kelowna, British Columbia, uh, Kelowna. and uh, Shambhala's in the Kootenays, and Base Coast is in the town of Merritt, and they're both pretty wild. If you like EDM. <laughs> yeah, that um, I don't know if I would call uh, British Columbia the Pacific Northwest, but the Pacific yeah. Northwest has a lot of a, a lot of that bass music culture. Base Coast that sounds familiar. Yeah. That was kind of like that that uh, festival that I shot up there. Nice. Yeah, no, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. I get it. it. And it's funny how, you know, your career just sort of goes through through changes. I, I know when I started in photography throughout my entire 20s, I just shot boats. So it was like girls in bikinis on boats. And that's awesome <laughs> when you're in your 20s, right? Just like going to EDM festivals is great. Boats. But then you wow, get in your 30s great. style changes, you get into your 40s. And now suddenly I'm like, okay, I'm going to do something really calm and <laughs> to stick to architecture. Yeah. yeah right yeah that's funny that's kind of a parallel to what i did yeah it's fine you don't really know where your photography career is going to go yeah and i think but, it's one way to keep it fresh too right like you can shoot, shoot yeah. so many genres within photography it's kind of an exciting career that way it is an exciting career that way because i felt like i was settled in and locked and loaded to shoot music but then i started to feel like i don't know about the financial li like viability of doing this i don't know how much money i can really make doing this and in retrospect probably could have made a lot but it would have it would have taken a lot of luck as yeah, well sure um and a lot of probably traveling probably the only way to do that would be like a big traveling artist photographer yeah um which would have been great but it would have been a totally different life that i have now yeah totally um, of course that's how annie Leibovitz got her start shooting bands on the road oh that's yeah she cool. did huh yeah fascinating but so your your focus now is very much on uh a and d and then commercial work yeah. um it, it, can you give me an idea of what you enjoy shooting the most and and why you ended up in in that um you know i don't really know i guess the, the way to explain it is like i mean like many photographers who shoot architecture and design probably got your start shooting real estate mm -hmm. chances are like 90 percent, <laughs> you know because it's like a it's an industry that's readily available and there's money to be made and sort of like a consistent volume type of business. So once you get into it, you either do it long enough to hate it yeah. or you do it long enough to get to the, to, to realize that you want to go to the next level with that style of work. Yeah. And, uh, just like, ironically, just like, which is, uh, the website that we're interviewing for right now, ironically, of course, what led me to the next level, just like many other people were, were Mike Kelly's video series. For sure. Because it, it kind of taught me about like, there's just this whole other world and way to do this. And it's not just sitting and in, in banging out bracketed HDRs and running them through some terrible software. Yeah. And then it kind of realized like, like I really enjoyed it. And I think part of that has to do with my personality type of, um, I'm an introvert. I don't always seem that way, but I definitely am. And so I realized shooting people and like you go through the ringer trying to run a professional photography career. You know, you shoot just by nature. You're going to end up shooting portraits. You're going to end up shooting family photos. Someone's going to ask you to shoot a wedding, shooting events. You're dealing with people constantly uh, and just doing enough of that. I realized I don't like shooting people. Yep. And what I saw in sort of this real estate, luxury, real estate architecture world is being able to photograph essentially an inanimate object and to do it in whatever creative angles and directions and narrative that you want to do mm -hmm. and I, I felt like that really was enjoyable for me and it was the pressure was lower but the ability to create high quality images was really high so there's like a high ceiling yep and a pretty maybe a pretty low floor but the floor even then isn't that bad when you get to a certain level so it's like it was a, an area that had a lot of range where I didn't have to deal with organizing models all the time, mm -hmm. which now has changed a little bit because there's so many, there's so much um, human presence in architecture photography, yep. but it's not the same as, as shooting portraits sure. and you know, organizing a, a family of eight. Um, yeah. So I really liked that, uh, 
aspect of it, I think it just kind of spoke to me. So I just kept driving with it. And I saw so much potential in that type of work. And it just kept building and building and building. Um, the biggest break that I got, I guess, and I don't know what your next question was going to be, but I'll see if I can transition, was I, I ended up out of uh, – out of the nightlife industry, I ended up working as a, like a marketing manager for a real estate team in Paradise Valley mm -hmm. in Arizona, which is a very high end luxury home market. Um, obviously shooting all the photos and doing video and, but also doing the social media and all this stuff. It was like a salaried position. Mm -hmm. um, and I did that for a little while. And that's when I really started to realize how much I liked uh, shooting really high end homes. Cause I got, I got to be exposed to like a lot more high end homes and homes that were designed by, architects and get like some more connections through that direction and uh when i was right when i was getting done with that about ready to not do that anymore because i wanted to pursue photography somehow some way and not really work full time uh, i got an opportunity with airbnb plus airbnb plus was a program that i don't think even exists anymore <laughs> which is funny uh but they were doing it was like a next level like one step up from Airbnb listings. Mm -hmm. And they were kind of testing this concept in the Phoenix market. And they somehow, someone connected me on an email with, they were looking for a lead photographer and they found me. And so they didn't know exactly how much volume there would be, but it would essentially be like a calendar style system where they would assign homes that needed to be photographed and make sure that they are a photo ready for their kind of next level program that they were trying to sell. Sure. Um, and so that was kind of like the, the golden hand that allowed me to sort of just make the jump and quit the job that I had and hope to God that I, this was going to help generate enough revenue while I could also try and build out my ability to freelance for a living. Mm -hmm. And it did. And it was the best, probably the best transitional thing that's happened in my career was making that jump. And you hear a lot of people talk about that, obviously, about um, how do you make the jump between financial stability, working a full-time job or career into doing creative work part-time or freelancing or building your own business. And um, the opportunity couldn't have presented itself at a better time. And that's what kind of allowed me to start building my own solo business. And this was back in 2018. So okay. it's been... It's been a while. Well, you've done an exceptional job of, of developing a, a, a really nice style. And I mean, technically, um, the, the images are, are exceptional. Um, you know, I find myself just, you know, you going through images and trying to find the what I would consider to be the imperfections or the flaws or whatever. And it, it's exceptionally difficult to find. So in a, in a very short amount of time, um, would you attribute a lot of that to just sort of trial and error and shoot, shoot, shoot? Or is it a lot of education and learning from other? Um, gosh, probably just like a long timeline of. I guess trial and error. I mean, just a long time of shooting and working in a specific area, producing images of a certain kind. Mm -hmm. And then you start to see other photographers who just do it at such an insanely high level that it blows your mind. Yeah. And you take, you know, pieces of that, try and reverse engineer it to try and figure out like how and why should I do this? Like figuring out the next level of color correction, you know, that can take your images. It's just something simple is getting the colors right and that can take your images to the next level and you didn't know that you weren't doing that for three years <laughs> yeah yeah you know yeah that's kind of the disappointing thing i find about the whole thing is you, you, i look back at my old portfolio images from a couple of years and it goes like oh, damn it if only i'd known that then you know i could have made that so much better and uh you know but that's, yeah that's that is how it goes i'm even looking at the the project that um lexi wrote about on the one time I was featured on here with the the thirty six below, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And there's so many things I'm seeing in this final image that it's making me sick. Oh, really? But it's it's a great image. But I, yeah, of course, in retrospect, I mean, you're like, oh, I should have done this. Should have made the shadows darker. Highlights are too bright. Blah blah blah. But that's just, I mean, that's just that's yeah. how it's gonna be. I don't think anyone looks at their work and yeah, and thinks that like this is this is the perfect version of it. Yeah, no, for sure. And uh, uh, we're always our toughest critic, anyway. So. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, it, now, getting into the actual shooting component, it, perhaps you can just walk us through uh, a little bit of your pre-production. What uh, is involved there? Uh, such as, do you do a scout? Uh, what kind of conversations do you have with your architect, designer, et cetera, before a shoot? Mm -hmm. All that pre-stuff. 
Um, yeah, scouting is big. Uh, it doesn't always happen. You want it to happen every time, you know, mm -hmm. and it's like it takes obviously takes coordination on the client side for them to want to or just have the ability to do it. Like when I, I work with a lot of interior designers and a lot of times they're bit like they're waiting on furniture pieces or the, the actual install of the project is happening within days of us supposed to shoot it. Yeah. So getting like in there to scout it is not always easy and just seeing it the way that it's supposed to be. Sure. Um, but uh, for, for bigger projects, uh, like scouting is huge because you can go through and just using an iPhone and just kind of build a shot list and figure out a couple things, understand the lighting of the space and the building and talk to the client about specific things that they see or want. Um, as far as shot list, some shot list is, is interesting because some clients have a very specific idea of what they want. Others have no idea what they want and they want you to make all those decisions, which I think is awesome. So I, I'm not huge on a hard shot list before shoot because I think things can change and you might not see the, sh you might not see the space at the, the time of day that when you're actually going to shoot it and you might, yeah. maybe change a couple things based on where the light's coming from. Um, but uh, the, I guess the biggest thing is just good, clear, concise communication with the client about, do you want to scout it first? What are you looking for? Do you have a number of images that you want? Um, what are you exactly you're trying to capture? Are there any obstacles, things that we need to avoid, things you don't think you're going to be installed in time? And then that, of course, helps us determine whether or not we need to shoot it for a full day or half a day or or what exactly the shoot is going to be like. Yeah. Yeah. One, you reminded me of, of something that I struggle with and have recently struggled with on a shoot in dealing with a client is, you know, I find sometimes you, you kind of, you try, try to figure out all these questions, like what kind of look do you want? Do you want the light, bright and area? Do you want the dark and romantic? Um, do you, do you want to see, what do you want to see on the tables of your restaurant, uh, hotel restaurant, mm -hmm. um, all, all these sorts of things. And sometimes I find that the clients just kind of, their answers are super short, you know, I'll do whatever you think or yeah, 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 napkins is fine. Or, and so it kind of makes you wonder, like, do they not care? Are they leaving it entirely to me? Do they don't not know? How, how do you deal with with clients that just don't <clears throat> seem to want to answer questions? Do you just then take it entirely upon yourself? Yeah. And it, it's taken me a while to, to have the confidence to do that, obviously. But I think that more than you realize clients actually want you to not just shoot the photos and um, press the button, so to speak. They want you to be the producer of the shoot. They, right. they don't even know what they want, yeah. but they know that you know how to do it. Mm -hmm. So if you, I've learned over time, if you have a client that's maybe uncertain or maybe doesn't, I, a client I just worked with recently um, was very professional and very great to communicate with over email. And then we had this big shoot planned. And once we finally got to the location, we didn't get to scout her before. So I didn't get to meet her before. And right when we got there, she kind of revealed, this is the first time I've ever worked with a photographer. <laughs> and I was oh, like, wow. Wow. wow, like I would have never guessed. Cause you were like really great about the communicative factors that are important. Um, and so it was kind of almost fun in that instance. Cause I was like, okay, well, let me show you how, at least in my experience, how shooting, in into this in this case it was a commercial office space mm -hmm. it was two story commercial office space nothing huge but it wasn't small but we were shooting it all day and it was going to take some trickiness to get the lighting right and the reflections there's a lot of glass everything's painted black and so i was like let me show you how i generally run my shoot days and i'll kind of lead the way and i'll ask you a ton of questions on what you think yeah. and we can kind of come to the conclusions together and then um I just had an additional shoot with her on a different project recently. And this second project, she was a pro. <laughs> she was, she knew what to ask, what to say, because we had been so like, I wanted to try and, and showcase like how in my experience that like a shoot can go. Mm -hmm. And I don't like to be too, um, I don't like to be too uptight and be too like methodical about have a, here's a shot list. We're going to print it out and we're going to do each shot and then we're going to go home. I like mm -hmm. it to be like a, sort of a creative experience trying to figure some things out trying to figure out do we need this shot is there another better shot and stuff like that and have some fun i always bring a bluetooth speaker with me on long shoots and listen to music and hang out because I, I don't like it to be this like uh i don't know cut and dry experience totally and so i think i think maybe setting that type of uh expectation with the client too is is important and i and you, you kind of find people who are in the design industry 
are generally pretty fun creative people they're creatives too so they they also want to have fun on a shoot it doesn't want to be this monotonous thing yeah. so i think kind of creating that relationship before even if you don't know the client it can be super valuable yeah no i'm i'm finding more and more lately that clients aren't showing up on set they're sending me to a place to shoot something and they're not there uh, and so you're trying to mm. figure out all these questions ahead of time you know what do you want to see on the tables etc cetera, etc cetera. and i generally have have been finding um, not in all cases, but certainly a lot lately that the more experienced clients, the clients who've worked with really big photographers and on really big jobs uh, are the least communicative. And and I wonder if perhaps that's just a product of, of they've allowed their, you know, uh, A-list photographers to go in and just do whatever they want and they've been happy with the images and they haven't had to communicate a desire. Um, so I wonder if that's maybe where that yeah. comes from. Uh, yeah, I would I would probably agree with you there. Because I think that maybe they they just know a professional when they see one, hopefully. It may, it's probably a compliment to you more than anything. Because they, they can just look at your work and look at it. Maybe they got a referral. And they're like, okay, this guy's got it. Let's give him the keys. And he, yeah. he will come back with amazing images. Yeah. And so, I, to be honest, I would... I, there's a lot of shoots that I've had where actually the client has, like, the designer, whoever I'm working with, has kind of set it up and then left. Which, uh, in my opinion, I love. Because I like working alone. And I love working hand in hand with my clients and having a great fun day. But I also like this sort of Zen meditative aspect where I can take my time mm -hmm. and figure out the shots and figure out how to shoot it and play with some lighting and do some experimentation. And, and there's less pressure on timeline and there's less pressure on someone else, maybe like the client almost being bored with how long it takes. For sure. <laughs> you know? For sure. Yeah. My, my concern uh, is always just like, uh, and I'm being really honest about my insecurities here. Uh, mm -hmm. I, you know, I go, go on and shoot for a, a, an interior design client at a, at a hotel or something like that. And you think that the water glasses look great with the wine glasses on the table. And then you deliver those photographs. And they're like, oh, I, I really hate those water glasses. Well, like, damn it. You know, I, <laughs> that's all I've got. <laughs> yeah. So, so no, I always can run into that. that. Yeah, you can definitely run into that. And, but that's sort of on, I mean... There's a little bit of responsibility to be held if if they're not going if there's not going to be a designer or someone there yeah. to account for the things that they need or don't need. Yeah, you you are obviously taking a little bit of a risk for sure. Um, so if you and you know if someone if a client was picky about that stuff, they needed they probably got to have someone on site. Yeah, and sure and to your day. point, I do actually have it in my contract that says if uh, if you choose not to be on site as an art director, uh, then the photographer's interpretation of uh, the set is uh, will be deemed acceptable. Uh, I think I stole that from a Mike Kelly. Mike Kelly's contract. Uh, <laughs> nice. It was a really good uh, clause in his contract, so I kept that one. But that is a great clause. Yeah, that'll get you out of some sticky situations because they want to. They want to have their cake and eat it too. You don't want to be there, but then you're not happy with the way that things were arranged. Yeah. There's a, you know, there's a pillow missing, and it's like, well, I mean. Uh, there's no way you're supposed to know that there was a pillow missing. <laughs> exactly. Okay. So it doesn't sound like you've had to deal with that too, too much. So that's, that's not, not like, I mean, actually, no, I definitely have, but I wouldn't say it's a, a lot. I there's, I mean, if you, as, as far as interior designers go, I, I've worked with ones that are so uh, picky about just the, the way each shot is styled because mm -hmm. it matters a lot to them, especially if they're trying to get published. Yep. And I, I think that's great. Because you care. I mean, you spend all this time designing this space. You want to make sure that everything is perfect and that there's not, you know, objects or things or stylings blocking each other. And there's all sorts of stuff. I have other clients that don't care as much about that stuff. They would actually rather have my creative interpretation of it than worry about, you know, styling every chair the right way. Yeah. yeah. Um, and they, of course, trust you. I mean, styling is part of the job when you're shooting interiors um you gotta you gotta adjust stuff and you gotta make some executive decisions on where what should go where and what lighting to use yeah and whether or not to use existing lighting that's in the home what windows to open or close yeah. um that's that's part of the job too so i mean if you, you got to know some of that stuff and i guess that's maybe they're hoping that you you do know that stuff if they're trusting you 100 percent. yeah yeah no for sure um so what is in your kit what do you carry with you uh, I am a Canon shooter, always have been. Mm -hmm. um, I, I wouldn't say I have a complex kit. I would say the majority of my portfolio is shot with middle of the road bodies, some middle of the road lenses, aside from a couple nice ones like a tilt shift or two. Mm -hmm. 
um, and just some simple flash equipment. So I would say my sim my simple setup for shooting interior design has been I use the Canon EOS R, the original. So and I, I haven't really been able to justify updating it yet. I mean, it's not even that old. It came out in 2018, mm -hmm. 2017. Shoots great. Image quality is great. It gives me everything I need. I don't necessarily need the the higher end versions of the R series, even though obviously I'd love it just because it'd be fun to have. Mm -hmm. um, so I sh I've shot, I mean, everything from the last couple of years has been on that Canon R. The majority of my interior design work has been on the 24 to 105 l lens that's the rf that came with that was released with the original r okay so the, the f4 um and that gives the 24 to 105 gives me all sorts of range for shooting great detail shots and vignettes which at least for me my interior design clients love those more than they love you know a, a good whole kitchen hero shot sure you know and so it, that those long focal lengths can kind of give you this like far away separation that's really unique that I've discovered that a lot of my clients absolutely love. Yeah. Um, so and that's a 2.8 lens, isn't it? No, that's oh, an F4. The 20, oh, they, with the yeah. RF, they stuck with the F4. Uh, yeah. Well, that this one was from, um, they might have an updated version of this lens. I don't think they have a 2.8, 24 to 105, but I think there's actually a worse version of this lens. So this is the L, the 24 to 105 F4. L that that was released with the original EOS R. Okay. I've used that so much. I've used that for just a ridiculous amount of images and it's plenty sharp. It's it's you know probably not as sharp as some of the more recent RF lenses, but it's so sharp that I could never ask for more. Yeah. yeah. I don't I don't think that some obscene level of tack sharp quality is is why people hire me. Yeah. The the photos are incredibly sharp. Huh. Um aside from that, I use 24 tilt shift yep and that thing's obviously a workhorse yep. um i haven't really discovered too much need for any other focal length of tilt shift besides that one i don't use the tilt as much as a lot of architectures architecture photographers probably do um i kind of learned my lesson that some interior designers get a little confused about uh a tilt shift <laughs> <laughs> and there's been times when i've i've given images back to a client and they almost because of the like it was like a it was in a salon and it was a straight on shot and there was a bunch of furniture and there was some long countertops and i shifted it all the way to the right and got this cool perspective so that you could still see everything yeah. that was inside these shelving units but you know it's giving you that nice diagonal shift feel yeah and they <laughs> they came back and asked me like if they could have the full version of the photo the, and not the cropped one <laughs> right and I, and it kind of struck me. I was like, oh, they think it looks cropped. They think that there's actually more image. Like they think it was one fourth of one image. Right. Yeah. And I was totally. like, okay, so maybe I need to be careful about like ma using the tilt shift when it really matters because the perspective can be a little offsetting when it comes to interior designers because they, they love, I mean, they love a photo of a single chair just as much as they love a photo of an entire room. Yeah. So. I don't think you need to reach as hard with the shifting, but I mean, that lens is, has come in such amazing handiness to me shooting all sorts of stuff, especially exteriors, obviously. Oh yeah. Um, and shooting like commercial spaces that you need the kind of hero shot of basically every room. Yeah. Um, no, for sure. I, I love having the camera ranger on live view mode and you start shifting that lens while the client. Oh watching, yeah. And they're just like, Whoa, what the hell is going on? Their minds just exploding. Right. You try to explain it. You're like, so I can actually just pan over with the lens. <laughs> And they don't really know what's going on and but then they're like oh, i don't i don't know I'm like okay well i'm gonna come back and and just shoot in the center <laughs> yeah, totally totally um other than that really just the uh more recently i got the 14 to 35 rf uh, do you shoot canon i'm canon yeah i've got the 5 dsr and the r5 oh man you have a tank my <laughs> lord um, the R5 is good. I, I like it. I, if I'm being totally honest with you, I still miss looking through the viewfinder and seeing real life. But, you know. Nah, yeah. I, you know, I love an electronic viewfinder, I got to say. Um, but the R5 is a beast. And um, uh, the only other lens, I just got this probably only a year ago, is the 14 to 35 from mm -hmm. the RF series. Very wide. Yep. Got to do some lens distortion correction, even after the fact, at least in my opinion. Some people seem to think that there's no distortion on it, but I don't, I don't know. I disagree sometimes. Huh. Uh, 
it's really those two lenses. Okay. Uh, and like, I would say I use, I would say I use one of them 90% of the time. Yeah, for sure. My, my point being is like, I, anyone listening who like is just getting started in professional photography or interiors or architecture or whatever, that you just don't, you don't need a fancy kit. Yeah. Like I, I use, I use almost a kit lens and a kit body, like almost a hundred percent of the time. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah so no, it's, it, it, I was speaking with uh, Muji Bojefo just a couple weeks ago, and the same thing. He's using a very basic DSLR, basic lens uh, kit. I don't think he is even using any tilt shifts. He has no yeah. lighting whatsoever, and I mean his his images are spectacular, like yours. Um, so that, yeah, that's, that just is super impressive to me. Yeah, well, it's like if you can maximize your knowledge and your experience of shooting with natural light, understanding what you need. I think one of the absolute must haves that the first like year or two of my shooting uh, real estate and architecture that I didn't have, I couldn't believe I didn't have once I got it was a circular polarizer. Oh yeah. yeah. That can just change. I don't know how much you use one of those. That can just change the game on like what you can do with natural light. Cause you can cut out reflections that were otherwise incredibly invasive, yeah. especially if you're talking about glass. Totally. And like that can give you a sort of dynamic that allows you to, to not have to rely on flash sometimes if you can cut out a lot of the, the, the glare and reflections and you can get some different nice looking deep blue skies and stuff like that with the CPL that yeah. um, that's that's a tool that I, I think doesn't come off my lens for the most part. Oh, really? Oh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. How, how do you find uh, just sort of color shifts and, and it's the occasional rainbow effect it's... and that sort of stuff? It sucks. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And I post process it or like the rain. Yeah, you're right. The rainbow's tough. The yeah. color shifts don't bother me as much. I don't mind doing color correction. Mm -hmm. Getting the rainbow look across the surface or a piece of glass because you have like solar tint on the other side. Yeah. It can be really tough to work with. Um, yeah. So, yeah, obviously, if you need to pop it off, you got to pop it off. But totally. um, I would say that thing like is such a tool for me because it's just shooting inside. You get light bouncing off so many different things in so many different directions. And it's the difference between being able to see inside of a wine cabinet versus not. Or being able being able to see what's going on inside of a bathroom yeah. versus not. <laughs> yeah. So my, my process for that is flagging. Um, but yeah, do you right. find uh, do you find that you're going more to a polarizer than you are to flagging? Or is it just for uh, situations I mean, where you can't control it? I wouldn't say they're interchangeable. I mean, I would say it's both when the situation is pretty bad, yeah. you know. That's why it's that's why it's just so great when you have a, a interior project that has a comprehensive like high end drapery system mm -hmm. where you can get like you can either get like a thirty percent light blocking you can get like a sheer and then you can get a blackout and they're already installed on the windows because you know it's like your flags are already installed <laughs> totally yeah but otherwise you, yeah I mean there's no other choice besides flagging in a lot of situations especially if you're shooting modern stuff with a lot of a lot of shiny surfaces. Yeah. And what are you doing for uh, lighting? Um, lighting, I use Flashpoint stuff. I really just have one 200 watt little guy and then uh, I have their 600 watt. Okay. Um, battery and powered? I use both interchangeably. Say that again? Uh, battery powered stuff? Oh, uh, they're all battery powered. They're all wireless. Yeah. They use the R2 transmitter from Flashpoint. I like Flashpoint stuff. I haven't felt the need to buy Profoto. I mean, it's about a quarter of the cost of Profoto's gear. I'm sure Pro Photos gear is, is unbelievable to, to, and reliable to work with on an everyday basis, but I've also never had a problem with Flashpoint. Sure. And they're, they're Adoramas. They're, they're essentially a United States brand of Godox. You know that? Yeah. And so they they have Adoramas warranty backing it. And so, like, the, I mean, I've never had an issue. It's And I, I really, all my work is probably built with a combination of natural light and flash or both or one or the other. Okay. Um, and I wouldn't say I, I love using flash as sort of like a, not a backup, but like a, say an image I think is already going to be pretty damn good with just natural light, getting a couple flash bounces or using an umbrella or whatever it is you want to use just to sort of get some, some fresh new light structure and cut out all the ambient light mm -hmm. and it hel also helps with windows yeah i mean obviously windows is one of the biggest things that you have to deal with shooting homes your whole career and you learn that quickly when you're shooting real estate right because that's the difference between a hdr shot with the windows blown out versus something that where you can really see the view and everything's everything's nice and cut out that's kind of like what you realize early on when you start doing that yeah um and we have a huge problem with that in arizona because 
it's extremely sunny all the time and all the houses are built with smaller windows in a lot of cases to in order to reduce sun exposure so you get these just like nuclear windows that are hard to balance and a lot of times the only way you can do that is with adding some fill flash inside sure. um so it's really just kind of like a shot by shot basis i would say is 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 whether or not i use flash but i use it i would say I use it quite a bit as a balancer uh to counteract issues that are involved with shooting with just natural light yeah so you'll shoot a series of brackets uh, sort of assess where the problem areas are namely windows and then use your flash just in in those areas so you're not you're not one of those guys who's going around to every chair every table uh and flashing different components and then compositing it all together um no i wouldn't say every chair and every table um i i mean bouncing has just been the greatest technique in my opinion i i it's you can you can, I've bounced off of the most ridiculous objects and colored ceilings you've ever seen in your life, and it's and it's 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 helped the image a lot. Yeah, and it allows me to be mobile and not set up multiple strobes and not build out multiple soft boxes and stuff like that. If I think I can get away with a bounce that can give me some really good fill flash, I definitely will try that first. Um, awesome. But that's yeah. What you described is probably exactly right, except I don't. The only time I would do, and maybe this is a good callback to when we talk about the 36 below shoot, is I did flash quite a bit of objects in that room. And I think that's more, I think that's more of a commercial or a hospitality or a restaurant yeah. or bar type of feel. Totally. Where like I when I'm in a space, I'm like, okay, this this place is gonna need some cool little like mood lighting on each individual seating area or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I would say that's where you're you're knowledge of shooting interior design versus shooting like a commercial space really comes out. You're like, okay, this, this shot could use some really flashy magazine type stuff. And so knowing how to do it is really valuable. Yeah. Yeah. No, so on that note, I would actually love to, um, usually I just ask people, you know, what's your general shooting process, but for you, I'd love to just, because you've already done the project of the week, that speakeasy, uh, 36 mm -hmm. below, um, uh, with, uh, Lexi at AP Almanac, if you can you walk us through what your shoot process was on that one how you shot it how you lit it uh, that sort of stuff so that and then i can refer back to it in in the article and and people can take a look at those images sure yeah so i keep like i'm looking at my other monitor over here i have that article pulled up um because you had already mentioned it this is a really interesting shoot to try and describe because it's so different than what i normally photograph because this is a it's called 36 below it's a speakeasy in Arcadia, Arizona, which is a neighborhood of Phoenix. Uh, and it was designed by House of Form, which is an awesome commercial and hospitality interior design firm that I work with quite a bit in Phoenix. They're all women. They're totally badass. And they're one of my favorite clients I've ever worked with. So That's it was awesome. really, this is one of my favorite shoes that I've done in the last year or two. And I think this is like a perfect example of, of their style and their ability to deck out a space. Yeah. So this is a speakeasy that's under a coffee shop and it is, there's no windows. So it's pitch black. And aside from all of the interior lighting design that they've done, which is essentially just can lights and then some LEDs lining the bar and some LEDs lining some recessed mm -hmm. shelving units on the side. So, so, I mean, immediately, you know, this is a 100% artificial light shoot, which is unusual for me. Um, so it took, it was, it was challenging to figure out what I needed to do, but so what I had to work with to start was all the lighting in there was controlled on a comprehensive lighting system that was on a little iPad. Okay. So that helped a lot where I could actually use in the, in mo almost all, if not every light in there dimmed to a certain level. So each shot that I did. It, I basically ran through all the different potential ways that you could light the room, mm -hmm. you know, dimming, dimming the LEDs under the bar while having the can lights at, at full brightness and vice versa and dimming everything yeah. and, and doing everything on, on bright. And so you're kind of almost using the room, this tiny little room, kind of only almost using it as like a strobus type of technique because you have the ability to control the lights already. Totally. So that helped a lot, but what I did do here was go around and use a small softbox and I flashed a lot of the chairs in a directional way back towards the camera. Mm -hmm. So you could get some of the texture because they're like velvet yep. and you want to be able to see and feel that stuff because it was so specifically chosen. Um, 
And I went around and I flashed each individual table too. And like I, like I was saying before about looking at these images, they're, they're too bright in their current state, at least in my opinion. But I think it, I think it's actually a good showcase of like what this room really is. Um, so it's a mix of the existing lighting in the room, no natural light, obviously, because we're underground. So it's a combination of what I had to work with, plus adding direct, basically direct flash. Because if you look at the ceilings, I can't bounce off of this mural on the ceiling. It's black and red. Yeah. Not really going to work. And so everything was done with like, each one of these shots was probably 25 layers or something completely absurd. Okay. Wow. And if you look at the, just because I, just because of those little notions of adding the light to each cocktail table and each chair at the bar. Um, if you look at the third image in that article, which is the vertical shot of the bar straight on, mm -hmm. you can see on the left and the right that I was bringing in, I was using just one light. So I wasn't using multiple strobes in there. So it's all composited, but I was bringing in flash on both the left and the right side. Right. Um, to try and to just to try and get like a flashy feel that wasn't one direction because there is no directional light in there. There is a light coming from a window. So that I don't need to try and pretend like there is. Yeah. So it's kind of fun to work with like light could be coming from any direction. Um, yeah. And I think you, I mean, you can get away with it because you could assume that it's motivated by the cans in the ceiling or mm -hmm. anywhere. The symmetry of the shot helps that as well. Um, no, I mean, I, I think these images are, are beautiful. I, I think you've done a, fantastic job of lighting them did you find that the color was fairly consistent between um yeah i did but it took a lot of color correction I, I in my opinion i had to make sure each shot was the same oh and one okay one aspect that was really tough not super tough but it was something that we had to think about while shooting was so if you look at the hero shots the two wide shots coming from either side mm -hmm. those back panels are led panels and part of the experience of the bar is that it's like you're supposed to be in this mystical fantasy land it's like an alice in wonderland type thing and uh those were on or some of them weren't working and so the, those back images are added in later mm -hmm. so they're composited in so you also have to imagine like how to showcase the fact that there is like these immersive led screens that the customer is supposed to be enjoying right while also keeping everything else perfectly lit um, it was tricky for sure. And you can see all the shiny objects, all the shakers and everything on the bar and the ceiling of the bar is gold. So, uh, there's tons of just reflections and stuff to interesting stuff to worry about, but it was fun doing the detail shots at the bottom that kind of showcase the, the finishes, the textures, like shooting down the staircase that takes you into the speakeasy, shooting one of the cocktails that is in the bar that it kind of gives you a feel of what the place is like. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I love think those vignettes. Yeah. Those vignettes are great. And a lot of my clients just absolutely love those vignettes that show a little context instead of just seeing, um, you know, the entirety of a room. And yeah. those vignettes, I feel like, kind of make the shoot. So it's an interesting, it's just an interesting hybrid between it, it being an architecture or hospitality shoot and then being able to kind of bust out these weapons of knowing how to do a little bit of cocktail photography, a little bit of food photography, a little bit of still life that can actually just amplify the final product. Even if that's, you know, not, that's not why you're there, if that's not really your wheelhouse, but it helped a lot in this shoot because it just shows you what the place is like. Yeah. Yeah. No. And I think this is kind of the perfect example of what I was talking about in the very, in the beginning is, is how <clears throat> you've seemed to master this hybrid ability to capture both the, you know, that commercial, we'll call it hospitality look, uh, very bold and, and contrasty uh, like this uh, to, uh, and then you look at another image in your portfolio and it looks like something out of uh, a Joe Fletcher shot, you know, it's just a, a <laughs> wow. natural window That's light, a compliment. that kind of thing. So yeah, no compliments on that. Now the, the LEDs in the background, do you, um, do you find in situations like that, because I can assume that they would spit out a bit of light and you've got all these reflective surfaces all over the bar. Do you find that turning those uh, TVs off uh, helps for your later composite, uh, or do you like to leave them on? No, yeah, we turn, we ended up turning them off. Um, because yeah, I mean, if you think about what an LED wall is, yeah, it's it's just it's just a ton of colors being shot into a room. Yeah, so you wouldn't say that's the most ideal thing when you're trying to color balance. Um, so I think we ended up turning all those off, but I also wanted to shoot with them on to understand where they're supposed to go yeah and and they, there's like the color palette on that on the images that are on the wall also it's like 
matching the room so it's like you need it to be sort of cohesive mm -hmm. but yeah anytime i'm shooting it especially shooting homes there's tvs everywhere um yeah always keeping those off because they're just they're just giant flashlights they're just shining all sorts of colors all over the room and that's not that's just going to be a pain in the ass later so absolutely yeah no I, and I, the colors of the space obviously help the, the photographs all immensely as well the, the mm -hmm. combination of the green and the orange it just it, everything just works really well it's one of those it things does. where you've nailed the compositions the lighting and, and they've really nailed the, the design it's just it all comes together really well well thanks i appreciate it yeah this is one of my favorite shoots that i've done that year um <clears throat> so um what maybe you can walk us through your typical retouching process i think we got a sense for, uh, of the speakeasy um how you kind of did that but on, on let's talk about maybe more of a um let's say a residential shoot where um you're dealing with a combination of tungsten lights and uh daylight coming in what what would be uh, your retouching process on this do you do your own retouching um yes i do do my own retouching i uh in the past i've outsourced real estate work and vacation rental stuff which i think a lot of people do it's pretty common practice now because this when you when you are i don't have as many of those clients as i used to um, which is great because i want to be shooting in sort of a commercial mode um, but i still have a couple real estate and vacation rental clients that i'm happy to shoot with that they are happy to pay the rates that i want to charge for that type of work um, and so in those instances, I often uh, outsource it because the demand in those little industries is so intense. They want the photos back the next day, <laughs> you know, yeah. and I and I'm already I already have five shoots that I'm trying to edit in the next two weeks. So um, I don't think there's any I think anyone who is dealing with a high workload should at least try and look into to getting some help with retouching because it's such a time consuming job. However, the, the work that I do with interior designers, architects, hospitality, restaurants, bars, whatever it is, I do all of that by hand mm -hmm. because I don't really trust someone else to do it. I want to add my own personal touch, my own tricks to it. Yep. And then at the end of the day, you need to be able to access those Photoshop files. Yep. And a lot of times when you're outsourcing, retouching, you're getting a JPEG back. And if you want to make certain edits on it, it's, it's kind of frozen. Sure. And you either need to go back to the retoucher that you hired or you need to make an edit to a JPEG and it's not always ideal. Yep. Um, so I, I, I enjoy the, the aspect of retouching. I think that's part of what spoke to me a little bit about when I first got into shooting interior design was that you realize that being a professional photographer being out in the field and shooting something is just part of the game, maybe half the game. And the way that we shoot in this specific industry is that a lot of times you're compositing. And if you don't know what compositing is, it's, it's taking multiple shots on a tripod of the exact same scene with different lighting, different setups, different things moving around. And you, you put it all together in one final image using layers in Photoshop. And I found that really fun. And it's, I mean, sometimes you want to pull your hair out how much time it takes to really get a whole project edited. But it always, it, I always enjoyed being able to, that, to say that, you know, 50, 60% of the time that I'm working, I'm actually just at home in my home office, editing, listening to music, hanging out with my dog. I, I really always enjoy that aspect of being a professional photographer. So I still love it. I still think it's super fun. It's well, what it really is, is problem solving. Mm -hmm. And I've always been like, I've always had like a problem solving mind. So I think that I like that aspect of it, like getting back home, opening everything up and figuring out how am I going to build this image the way that I imagined it initially. And it, it can be hard. Um, but as far as the retouching workflow goes, I mean, pretty pretty similar to, to most photographers, I would say. I use Lightroom. I know a lot of people use Capture One. Um, I'm actually pretty interested in exploring Capture One and seeing if I should switch to it or not. I'm not, I'm not super well versed in, in the differences, the nuances. Um, <clears throat> but I've always used Lightroom. So um, I basically call and edit everything, pre-edit everything in Lightroom before it goes to Photoshop. Mm -hmm which again, I would think most professional photographers are familiar with doing. Yep. Um, but <clears throat> we sort them all into a stack and then I bring them into Photoshop and then I have all my layers that I can work with. And those layers are anything from a couple ambient shots to, you know, seven different flash layers and four different ambient layers and maybe an additional layer. Like I got to add a fire in a fireplace or I got to add a painting to a wall or something like that. 
Um, so you're kind of bringing like your tools, your pieces in there and then trying to blend them all together. And um, I'm a big fan of the big soft brush, just, just putting everything together with a nice big soft brush, nice and slow with a low flow and just kind of slowly getting everything to blend properly and not using too many hard edges, trying not, to, I mean, in a perfect world, I don't want to be using the pen tool to cut out everything. Mm -hmm. I want to try and get everything together in a natural way without having to get super methodical with it. But sometimes you have to, just especially depending on what kind of clientele you're working with. Yeah. Um, so I would say that from a summary standpoint, my retouching is really a, a mix of blending flash and ambient light together. And then um, color correction, I think is absolutely massive. If you can just figure out how to use a simple hue saturation layer to get the colors right in an image, it's just a world of difference between an image that doesn't have that, especially when you're talking about blues as an, an interior design, like, like blue, just rem getting the, removing the blues and color correcting whatever the blues are washing out is the difference between a, a clean, high looking magazine polished image and not. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it, it seems to me that every shooter has a different technique for that. So um, may, maybe I'll give you a specific example. Maybe you can talk me through how, how you like to do it. Uh, it you're in a, a, a big um, <clears throat> hotel ballroom. You cannot turn off the tungsten lights uh, and you've got daylight spilling in the windows. How do you deal with the color correction and something like that? Um, if you can't turn off the lights, that's a good, if you are able to, that's a good opportunity to shoot flash because you can cut the ambient light out obviously using high shutter speeds and then be able to have a flash base that is clean and not being color contaminated by those ceiling lights mm -hmm. there's other situations that if you're not going to use flash or you don't want to or you don't feel it's necessary you're just going to have to do a lot of color correction by hand and that's just how it is the the orange that's spilling all over the walls and the bars and the chairs it needs to be dealt with somehow um so it chances are it's you doing it by hand if you can't get those lights off and you can't use just one single light source um it's i mean that's 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 retouching for you yeah i mean it's it's all about trying to it's a, figure out how to solve the problem and how to actually not get into the problem in the first place yeah no for sure and it's funny because you're in arizona i'm in canada so for me um <clears throat> especially this time of year with interiors uh it, it, the tungsten interior is often much more powerful than the little bit of blue that's spilling in through the windows from the exterior. Yeah. Uh, and so you're often color correcting to 3,800 Kelvin. Um, yeah. But then you've got these blue washes right next to the windows. And of course you start pulling that color saturation out, then you're bleeding into magentas. <clears throat> you get a little yep. bit of red haloing going on. It's a, it's yeah. a bit of a nightmare. <laughs> it's definitely a bit of a nightmare. Yeah. It's not fun. Um, I am a little bit jealous though. I mean, if, in in places like Arizona, I mean, we get 300 and who knows how many days of sunshine, direct sunshine. Yeah. And I sometimes I see images and I'm like, that, that just has to be a nice overcast sky outside. That's the only <laughs> way they got that lighting. And I wish I could work with that. Yeah. But we don't get it much. <laughs> yeah, totally. I guess for you, you're often looking for when is the sun on the opposite side of the building? Whereas for us in Canada, we're like, oh my God, sun, we've got to take advantage of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Except it's... Except that having direct sunlight is, is fun to work with and some clients really like it. So, I mean, it is hard. Choosing the time of day is, is you know, it's one of the things that's on a shoot by shoot basis. That's still uh, an interesting thing to try and figure out with your client because a lot of times they want you to make that call. And it's not always as cut and dry as you think because there's a huge difference between the sun being low and you're not getting any direct light in the room versus it being the morning and all the direct lights coming in the room. And yeah. And sometimes clients want both and you're like, well, I, I mean, I can't really do both unless we shoot the entire day. Right. Um, so trying to figure out a time of day and in and, and how a space is being lit by the weather that's outside is is all, it's something that you always have to figure out. It's never obvious. Yeah, totally. Now, do you um, do you use uh, luminosity masks or any plugins or anything like that? I do. Actually, I use Lumenzia. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I do, too. Yeah, I've found it. I don't, I don't use it in a very complicated way. Mm -hmm. I use a lot of their default, like dark, medium, light presets. And yep. Just kind of play with them a little bit and adjust them as needed and kind of brush them in. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I've found that 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 tool set is can be extremely powerful. Yeah. I mean, it, it could be the difference between 
your your image having like moody nice dark shadows and not and and it can it can really add some mood to an image that you couldn't really necessarily get to by hand really powerful concept luminosity mask if you can be a master of that yeah. then you can you can really create some high-end images yeah no for sure for sure um awesome so um i wonder if you can talk to us a little bit about uh, the business side of things um and how you bill um uh, so i with the clients that I work with, I generally am selling a full day rate or a half day rate mm -hmm. because depending on what you want to shoot and how you want to shoot it, it's not, it, you can't really shoot for an hour or two. There's a whole process involved with setting up, getting there, figuring out shots, moving around, especially if you're going to style a space. I mean, you, you might, you could spend 45 minutes or an hour with an interior designer, just styling one image. Sure. And you kind of got to make that clear that that's the case, uh, depending on what they want. Because it's like, if you want this many images, and do you plan on styling them with me? Because if you do, we're going to be here all day, yeah. which is fine. But that's why the day rate exists, and we're going to have to go that route. Um, so that's generally what I charge, either half day or full day rate. And sometimes that will... I found that like you shouldn't be... You also shouldn't be scared to create a custom quote for a client, depending on what they're looking for. Cause there's just so many different types of clientele that have such different intent in commercial like usage that they're looking for. You, if you had a furniture company, that's, you know, like CB2 wants to do a full day with you, your day rate should not be what it should be for a local interior designer, in my opinion, cause they're, 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 you're selling furniture on an international scale. Mm -hmm. It should be, it should be a huge, it should be a significantly bigger rate because you're create you're potentially creating just an insane amount of value there versus an interior designer that just wants to use the images for their Instagram, maybe get lucky and get published somewhere is a totally different intent and in, in access that like the value of the images may or may not be completely different. But um, I would say a full day is what I would generally try and work on because you don't want to be rushed by the time. If you're shooting a half day, whatever you consider that to be, four hours, three hours, five hours, by the time I mean, by the time you're halfway through the shoot, you feel rushed because you feel like you 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 only booked that much time, and maybe the client only has that much time, and it's 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 tough. It's photography takes a long time, so yeah, um, I, I that's ideally the structure that I like to work at. And do you, you do tend to find that you, you can generally achieve a, a very typical number of photos per hour? Say you're on set for eight hours, do you kind of end up? Yeah. And that's that's something that I've kind of struggled with over time is trying to understand how many, I mean, it's a very subjective question yeah. and answer is like, how many photos should you provide to a client who's paying for a day rate, so mm -hmm. to speak? Yeah. Um, because obviously the, the photos and the images themselves are the product. So the more product that you're giving the client, the more valuable it should be. Um, but the way that I've always shot, and this goes back to me shooting music and just everything that I've always photographed is I, I'm a shooter. I like to shoot lots of different ideas and images and, and maybe angles and experiment with a couple of different things. I don't really like to be in there with a set and done shot list printed out. Like I, I like to shoot a lot mm -hmm. and uh, sometimes I end up giving my clients a lot of images if they're a great client that I love. But where you get into the conundrum is is giving away too many images and feel like you're watering down what like you should have charged more for for what you're giving them. You get like if you give a client forty to sixty images, but like ideally you were you're originally talking about thirty images. It's like where you know there's got to be some give and take where these images need to be accounted for financially or in some sort of compensation. Yeah. Um, I think one of the best ways to do that that I've done with a bunch of my clients is you you create like a a limit on how many images you're gonna include in the rate and then any additional image after that is gonna be a fee. Sure. So then you're kind of labeling like the work that you're doing as intrinsically valuable in that it's you know it costs time and money and effort and creative ability uh to even just shoot one really nice image. So yeah. Um, I would say that's something that I'm always trying to figure out because client, there's so many different types of clients out there. And I, I don't think that there's really a, like a, a boilerplate way to go about it. Sure. Now, are you typically, um, shooting everything that you're going to deliver or do you deliver a whole bunch of raw options and then they choose the finals to get retouched? 
Um, I shoot everything that I'm going to deliver. I try, I try and, I try and argue on site that like, look, we don't need this shot because we're going to only probably do somewhere around this many shots. Yeah. We already have, we already have this room photograph, so we don't also need it from these two other angles. Try and like, it's, it's all about setting expectations and then trying to maintain those expectations. Mm -hmm. And of course, sometimes those lines get blurred. If you didn't have great communication with the client beforehand, then you might run into some differing ideas about what we're really going to be doing that day. And, and like I said about interior designers and detail shots, they just absolutely love the detail shots. And those yeah. don't take a lot of time and effort to shoot on site, but they take a lot of time to edit. And you're, there's like a whole quantity of them. And they're probably shot with natural light. They're not as complicated from a lighting perspective, but it's that's another thing that's hard to account for is like, okay, we decided on 20 images we're going to shoot today. Mm -hmm. And then it kind of turns into like, oh, can you just grab like, you know, a handful of details and then like you can easily get carried away both on my end being a creative and i like want to shoot and provide a bunch of really nice images to my clients but then you're also like setting yourself up for them wanting all those images so that's where setting the expectations comes in i guess about about you know what, what i'm going to deliver and for what cost and then ideally if if you want the rest of these images or all the other options that we shot then you need there's a retouching fee is a lot i guess a lot of people use it in that sense as a retouching fee if you want me to edit and finalize this image you got to pay for the time and effort yeah no for sure for myself i do uh the shoot and then retouching every individual photo is a separate charge um but uh, it sounds like the, the way you're doing it there where you get a certain number of shoots uh, shots uh, delivered shots depending on how long your day is plus mm -hmm. anything extra beyond that uh, same sort of model just a different way of communicating it to the client yeah definitely and there's there's clients i've been working with for a long time where I, i'm very uh very flexible and open like whatever for we have kind of an agreed rate and they give me a ton of business and, and they've given me a ton of referrals. So it's like those type of clients, you kind of like, I don't mind providing just, you know, whatever they need shot. Yeah. And it's, you know, I'll make it work for the rate because our relationship's so good. And there's, there's, there's extra benefits happening over such a long fruitful relationship working with a company that those things don't matter as much. Um, I would say they matter a lot more when you're shooting like commercial architecture, like kind of like what you do, because those images can be complicated and long to shoot yeah. and long retouching. And so you, you can't really afford to just like edit all those and send them over. Yeah, no, for sure. You'd be in front of the computer forever. Um, do you ha find yourself kind of with an average amount of time to, to retouch uh, the average shot? Um, no, I would say I'm pretty quick. I mean, like I said, I try and, I try and start simple and if I can get the image put together with simple methods first, I, I will do that. And I only go to the really complex type of advanced retouching if I feel like it is true, if it's like I really need to. Mm -hmm. So I, I would say I can move through photos pretty fast, but the entire process of <clears throat> just sorting them and then doing the, the pre-processing yep. before you do the compositing and then you bring it back and then at least in, in what I do, I, I never really finish images inside Photoshop. I use it as sort of a compositing tool. Mm -hmm. And so there's always post-processing done after the composited version of the image. And so then I go through and then I'm like doing like final revisions. And one of the biggest things I've learned is just about like, like what, I mean, there's so many different factors on how we, the final images are being viewed and how they actually look. And when you're editing all day long, you you start to go crazy about you don't understand like how the colors in an image look because you've been staring at your computer for so long and you don't have context anymore about yep. about accurate colors. Yeah. So I never, I mean, I never ship images off in the same session as in I am finishing them because I I could come back two hours later and be like, oh my goodness, I didn't see half of these things totally. because I just was I was caught in the weeds. Um. Another thing is like bright, even brightness on your monitors and your laptop and just, just viewing images in like a way. A lot of times when I get done with the images and I think they're done, I will export them and then I'll take my laptop and I'll just go into like my kitchen where there's a ton of natural light and I'll set my laptop down and then I'll maybe give myself a little break and then come back and just look at them like fresh on a laptop that maybe the brightness is dialed down just a little bit, just kind of, I'm trying to imagine how they're going to be viewed yep. by the customer. And so I always try and give it these final rounds of like, 
is is the brightness okay like do these are these too bright are these not bright enough how are these going to actually look to someone if they open it on their phone totally totally I, that, yeah it, i think that's exceptionally good advice um and advice that i haven't heard often enough is taking a break after you finish working on a bunch of photos go look at something else and then come back uh, because i guarantee you you're going to find those images something's going to pop out at you and one thing you just suggested um, i'll export to my phone and my ipad because um, although I'm working on a color calibrated monitor, that's not what my client's going to be looking at them on. So how yeah. how, how are they going to see it? So exactly, the iPad is huge. Yeah, exactly. I used to do it with an iPad too. I, I now I like doing it on my laptop, but same thing. Because it's like, or even the phone. Because it's, I mean, how many people are going to see the work on their phone? Quite a yeah. bit. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, for sure. And I find actually funny enough, my you know my color professionally color calibrated monitor it looks a lot different than all of my other devices. Uh, although it's 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 ironic it's supposed to be what it looks like it doesn't look like you know my ipad yeah. and my phone and everything i know else. that that's always been a frustration it's you think that you have like the highest end color calibration yeah. but you don't i'm using this dell ultra sharp that i feel like is almost identical to my mac which is a brand new mac mm -hmm. book and that's good enough for me because then the mac book is almost identical to my phone and it's ideally just keeping those three hopefully identical yeah but it, they, yeah, it's one of the most frustrating things ever. You go see your work later, even when it's been published, and it's like on a website, and you're like, "Oh no!" <laughs> yeah, totally, like those, totally. Those blues are not the blues that I thought they were. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. I find that's usually a good indicator of am I even close? Is how does it look in print? That it seems to be the best. Uh, yeah. Judge, but um, now, how do you deal with uh, third-party uh, usage? Um, we're in a position as architectural photographers that everybody wants our shots. So um, when the architect wants to give your shots to the interior designer and the hardwood cabinet guy, what, what do you do? Um, I always require licensing, paid licensing. I didn't used to be that way. And of course, there's instances where it's so hard to manage, like it's some random furniture company or some carpet manufacturer screenshots your Instagram and post, puts it on their Instagram page. All you can really do is try and DM them and say, look, you got to pay for licensing for this. You're going to use it commercially. You don't have permission to use this. It's hard to get that to work. I mean, the, the social media is a crazy place, yeah. but <clears throat> um, I always go about it before the shoot. So mm -hmm. I do cost sharing. So the more parties that are involved in a shoot, uh, I charge a flat fee for that each individual party that's coming on, mm -hmm. depending on whatever agreed fee was. And then everyone splits the rate, so it's it lowers everyone's cost. I'm sure it's I'm sure it's a familiar model to you. I'm sure you've heard it before. Um, but I always try and advocate. Look, if you can get the builder, if you can get the architect, you can get the cabinet company, you can get whoever in, involved. We can actually bring these costs down quite a bit, and then everyone can be happy, and we don't have to deal with people uh, coming in after the fact. If they come in after the fact, I often do a per image rate. And oh, okay, yeah, it's not going to be as good of value as if they bought into the shoot in the first place, you know? Yeah. yeah. The biggest thing is in my rate sheet, I mean, I make it very clear that there's no giving the images away to third party vendors um, and anything like that, but it obviously doesn't always go that way. Yeah. That's, that's one of the trickiest things ever. And obviously one of the hottest topics of, of architecture photography, I feel like it's very, very strong as far as intellectual property defense. It's pretty, pretty hot topic. And so, all you can do is try and educate and get licensing involved beforehand so everyone's happy yeah. so that you don't have to go after a company that decided to upload your photo onto a, the side of a van and then for sure go yeah. down this route. That really um, is key is just the communication ahead of time, being really clear with your client about, about what, what you can and can't do. I mm -hmm. often find, though, that it's usually that client leaves that company and those photos are still sitting on their server somewhere and the new person comes in, they have no idea. So they just start uploading them to whoever that that's the yeah. real challenge. It's yeah, it's playing whack-a-mole. I mean, people don't, people don't know. I mean, people, especially because of the way social media is people don't understand that intellectual property is, can be a pretty big deal in that you can't have, um, can't have multi-million dollar furniture companies just using your work without retribution or, or compensation it's just not it's not how anything works yeah and and then you look at like the concept of credit get for your images that they'll give you photo credit but it's like that doesn't do anything especially with the way that 
social media algorithms have rapidly changed. Giving me credit on a some big account with 600,000 followers, giving me credit on the image. It doesn't, it's not doing anything for, for you anymore. You kind of maybe used to sort of be that way, but it's definitely not. Yeah. And so it's kind of just an excuse to just for companies to get free collateral. Um, so putting your foot down is obviously the right thing to do. And it's just completely exhausting. I don't think it's anyone's favorite part of this type of industry, yeah. but, um, getting educated on that stuff earlier, sooner than later, I think is massive, mm-hmm. especially because, I mean, there's just more money to be made for you and people will, you're setting a standard for yourself and ideally the other photographers that work around you that, um, you know, images need to be paid for. Yeah, no, for sure. And I think the more photographers realize that and become educated on that and then educate their clients hopefully word will get around that you can't just steal images eventually i don't know maybe that's optimistic but i don't know i my honest opinion about it is that it's it's always just going to be paddling upstream yeah um it's especially just how rapid the internet is changing and, and how rapid social media is changing there's just some companies it's not even that companies are uneducated they simply don't care because you you're not really going to go up against them. And it, it, it's just like, they know that some photographer in some town isn't going to try and doesn't have the resources to sue them for stealing an Instagram photo. So mm-hmm. it just kind of becomes like the norm, which is just tough to deal with. But yeah, uh, that's, that's why it's always great when you have clients that they, they come in knowing that this is how that stuff works. And it's mm-hmm. always so refreshing, you know, and you, you want to go the extra mile for these people because they are, they have already said, Hey, we, we have these many parties and we all want to license and send us all the contracts. And you're like, wow, what a breath of fresh air that they are professionals and they know how this works. Yeah. So do you do a contract ahead of time? Um, I don't do a contract ahead of time. I send a sort of written ter- usage terms sheet. Yep. That's also along with my pricing sheet. Yeah. So like the expectations have been set and they've already, they've already seen and acknowledged it. Right. So um, I don't do a written contract. I feel like some, for certain types of clients, it's, it can be a headache to try and get that done. Mm-hmm. Um, and from a legal standpoint, I think it's, they, they've seen and acknowledged my usage rights and terms because it's right there on my sheet yep. with my pricing and everything. So, I mean, and then you, you reiterate that conversation ideally over email or text. Um, and so it's just well understood, you know, there is no, uh, there's no trying to get out of it. Yeah, no, for sure. I, I totally agree with you. I actually, uh, I, I didn't used to do contracts because I tried to put myself in the client's pers- uh, position. It's a pain in the ass. Somebody sends you this paper, you've got to print it out, fill all the things out, sign your name, scan it, send it back. Pain, pain in the ass, right? Uh, mm-hmm. But uh, recently I switched to um, just an online terms and conditions uh, form. And it, you go through the conditions, you click accept, 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 and then click the box to accept all conditions above, submit. And uh, honestly, it's worked super well. Um, make sure that they've read everything and they've agreed to everything. And then it sends a, a copy to my email just saying so-and-so has mm-hmm. agreed to all these terms. That's a good idea. And that actually brings me back to what I should have mentioned when we were talking about pricing is that yeah. I don't know how you invoice. I'd be curious to know, but I use Square, okay. and I I essentially have the entirety of my my business, um, and they charge a pretty decent fee on credit cards. But I love Square, and they they sending my because every everyone's familiar with Square. They have been. So when you send off an invoice, I work with a lot of clients for like the first time or the second time, or it's a referral from someone else, yeah. and so having a familiar Familiar invoicing platform where someone can just swipe the credit card is absolutely massive and it allows you to get paid way faster. Yeah. Um, I actually have business bank accounts that are open with Square that allow me to sort out. Like I, I have taxes automatically put away from each invoice that's paid. Nice. So um, then I use those accounts to pay my estimated. Ta- I don't know how it works in in Canada, but I, you know, our estimated tax is here, and then Arizona has their own sales tax. Yeah. sales tax esque type of tax that I have to charge the client. Um, yeah. In and Canada, all, all you, just, you just, sorry, you just uh, take whatever your tax rate and add 10 times to it. And that's what we would pay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's not fun. Taxes are not fun. So if you can find a platform or something that can help you with that, it's great. Yeah. But Square also gives you all of these great reports that are generated. Um, and I can just see my revenue for the year. It generates my tax forms. It's basically the the accountant for my business. Yep. Um, 
And the invoicing is so quick and easy, and it's unbelievable how fast people will pay a highly accessible invoice from a vendor that they're already familiar with. Yeah. If you're if you're going around trying to get people to mail you checks or you're using some sort of obscure invoicing platform, people are it's it's a you want to make it as easy as possible for people to send you money. Mm -hmm. And I've found that Square has just been phenomenal for that. So I, I would highly recommend them. But the reason I went back to that is because they have a they have a contract implementation in their invoices actually. So I think that they have like a terms and conditions portion that you can activate that in order to like so you could send it as an estimate and then they would have to accept terms and conditions and then they accept the estimate and then that's everything's taken care of in one i just haven't done it yet but i should look into it now that you mentioned it because that's a good idea people are pretty used to checking boxes yeah on terms and conditions so that's a pretty good way to do it be like oh okay all right fine <laughs> yeah it's quick and easy and I, I feel like it kind of forces people to read those terms and conditions they can't really just because they're signing their name to it so that they're not just going to skim over it I, I i don't think right but, no with square you're going to be paying three percent on that right yeah yeah but i mean the fees are i mean tax deductible so it, i i consider it the cost of doing business because i love the platform sure and it comes off of my you know, taxable income at the end of the year. So yeah, it's oh, okay. water under the bridge as long as you're okay with that upfront 3%. Yeah. Um, it's for me, it's worth it. Cause I think they're the most cohesive invoicing, like kind of financial business, small business platform that there is. They give you so many tools, especially if you were selling all doing all sorts of different invoicing styles and contracts and you're almost like doing image slicing sync products you can organize everything out so well um yeah so that's what i use what yeah. do you use uh it, i'm old school i honestly um i use excel uh, i've got an excel template uh i go in i put in all my uh, hours at rate and it propagates out a final number and that's it uh yeah i am old school with that sort of stuff well yeah, well, for yeah, that's accounting. Then, what do you? How do you send invoices to the clients? Uh, yeah, so I my invoice is an Excel template, uh, and I simply export it oh. as a PDF and email it off. That's it. Oh, how do you get paid? It's made checks, or you oh, take Zelle, or what? Ch so I'd say probably seventy five percent of clients are check, uh, and then the other twenty five percent would be e transfer. Nice. Okay. Well, you're saving that three percent. That's for sure. <laughs> Yeah, uh, but I've also been told that uh, depending on the credit card that a person uses, like American Express is really bad, or um, or credit cards where you have a high rewards systems, um, they can be up to four or five percent in transaction fees. Yeah, wow. But and then you know, I don't know. I, yeah, I could I could maybe explore it, but I, I don't find too many invoices to be less than fifteen hundred bucks either. So. Yeah. I don't know. Are people really going to be paying by credit card for those sorts of transactions? Maybe. Uh, yeah, maybe you're right. But yeah, you're right. And it's the type of clientele looks like you work with a, you know, very responsible companies. I would say I work with a little bit more of like mom and pop companies a lot of times, like, you know, homegrown interior design firms. It's like two, two, like a designer and her assistant or something. Yep. And so in those cases, it makes it a little bit easier for me to provide them with like the simplest, the lowest common denominator. Because then they can maybe lean on credit or whatever they want to use. But yeah, I mean, if you have a system of people mailing you checks reliably, then yeah, don't break it. Yeah. And a lot of them actually, now that I think of it too, um, are just transitioning now over to EFT transfers. So I send them a void check, they put me in their system, and that works well too. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. They're just, just transferring it directly. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I want to be sensitive to your time here. We're coming up on an hour and a half, but uh, I saw on Instagram that you were married not too long ago. So it kind of brought up the question for me. Uh, you're obviously super busy. You're constantly producing new images. Uh, you said you do your own retouching. How do you find the time to uh, sort of enjoy life outside of shooting and editing? <laughs> uh, it can be tough. Um, I try and keep weekends to myself selfishly. I try as hard as I possibly can to not shoot on the weekends because I want to feel a normal work work life balance. And all of my friends, we, we have a pretty big social life. We have a lot of friends in the Phoenix Scottsdale area. Um, and so when it comes time for the weekend, I want to be able to hang out with my wife, my friends, I want to be able to go do stuff. So I try not to work on the weekends. And that means, I mean, I would say most days nowadays, I'm up at five, probably trying to retouch 
for the first few hours of the day. Wow. And then I probably have to get ready for a shoot or do some other things. And then probably have maybe have a shoot or two or one full day shoot. Um, and then come home, probably ingest, call my photos, organize. If it's a smaller shoot that I'm outsourcing and retouching, get that uploaded. And it's just a constant, um, just constant organization, just, just trying to stay timely. And um, it's hard. I mean, yeah, Monday through Friday is, is, is a workhorse when you're trying to balance. I mean, I, I have five, six projects that I need to be editing and sending off right now. Wow. And so sometimes the, sometimes it creeps in where you're like, man, I'm way behind. But if you stay, I'm really good about organization with my calendar. I'm really good about using notes organize everything that needs to to do lists everything needs to be done in a single business day so it's just it just takes a lot of perseverance um just being extremely organized there's a lot of people that that would maybe outsource the invoicing and accounting or maybe have some sort of other assistant method because they can't manage it all maybe one day i can do that and that'd be awesome but um i would say i'm a really organized person and and i have no problem grinding it out really i mean I, I like to try and just think that i have good work ethic work ethic my parents always had insane work ethic my mom is like i mentioned before has been a freelancer her whole life she's worked from home for forever and she's just absolutely grinded to provide for my family my whole life so that taught me a lot about just the motivation of of getting up every day and working and that i'm i always trying not to just take for granted for the fact that i work for myself and I was just trying to think like, I'm so fortunate to live, just have the, the business life that I have. I work from home in my own home office, running my own business, working alone. And if that's not enough to get me up and get my work done, then I don't know what is. Good for you. That's awesome. So what? just really quickly, what does the next 10 years look like for you? Any big plans? Um, man, I mean, we got married almost two years ago, May 30th in um, 2020 or 20. 21. Um, but I mean, we're going to have kids one day. Definitely. I mean, we're the type of uh, couple that will definitely pursue a family and it's going to be great. And I guess for me, as far as my business, it's like, I just want to keep getting bigger and bigger and better and better at the work that I do so that every time I do work that it's a payday yeah. and that the time is attributed appropriately, you know, to always maintain that, that work life balance, yeah. you know, you never, Ideally, <clears throat> ideally, you work for yourself so that you can create your own life. Yeah. And you never want to lose sight of that. And you never want to kind of bite off more than you can chew and end up constantly chasing a ton of, you know, productivity and, and always thinking that you're not making enough money and all that. And so yeah. I'm only 30 years old. We're only 30 years old. Um, so I, I would say that we have a pretty bright future as far as a work life balance, but it, it has to be it has to be maintained, right? You know, you have, you have to try, and I'm a very social person and I, I love doing all sorts of recreational stuff with my friends, nothing more than we love than hanging out with our friends. So yeah. if, if and we can never lose sight of that, as far as um, maintaining a healthy personal life, I think it's just as important as maintaining a healthy work life, you know? Yeah. I, I don't want to be a hermit crab editing photos and only working. Um it's because then you, it's a it's a zero sum game if you do that you know so i would say work life balance is a really hard thing to do but it's it's just as much of a priority as as the work or the life good for you it's good that you've got that attitude and you you it seems like you figured it out uh which is really really impressive your your work is super impressive uh your work ethic uh uh is really uh in, in pretty incredible um obviously uh the amount that you put out uh and you're maintaining a, obviously your weekends that's that's pretty good uh and uh and you just you're a really nice guy so i can see why uh you've you've had a lot of success in, in a relatively short amount of time um your your work is beautiful i definitely encourage everyone to go check it out uh both at uh, kevin brost on on um instagram and also your website which is just uh kevinbrost.com b-r-o-s-t uh, of course, uh, this will be tagged to the, or embedded within a, an article on AP Almanac, so everyone will have a chance to see your images and go to your website. And um, Kevin, I really appreciate you taking the time to to chat with me. Your valuable time. Um, I know you've got you said five or six projects on the go, so uh, <laughs> yeah. this has been awesome that you've been willing to spend this time with me. So thank you very much uh, from me and and also for for, for all of the, uh, the the readers of AP Almanac. Uh, we all really appreciate it. Well, thanks. It's been so much fun talking to you. I really, first time sitting down and doing a video interview about 
my photography career with someone. So it's, I mean, I was doing just as much reflection and learning about it as is you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's no, life, it's... life happens quick, you know, they yeah. like, uh, it's cool to, to kind of think about the things that I've learned and in how to maybe pass that knowledge on. Um, I feel like one of the things that it, with photography, maybe it's less now, but one of the things about architecture photography is it's so hard to find out like details of how people create their images. And it was like, it's, it's probably still is, but I remember five years ago, I was, I mean, you had Mike Kelly stuff, but then it was like, how are people achieving this certain type of look? And it's still a mystery to this day. Uh, to me, certain guys. Oh, I should have mentioned before we go. I mean, the the guys that I looked up look up to as far as their photography work is Brandon Barre, yeah, fellow Canadian of yours, yep, and uh, Douglas Friedman. Oh yeah, yeah. These guys, these guys, their work to me is like just paintings every time they publish an image. Yeah, and I think it's cool that you those guys have probably had photography careers that eclipse mine. But it's it probably took them that long to figure out how to get that look and to figure out those retouching techniques, those shooting techniques, so that like the lesson being like there's always so much more to learn. And if you really want to deep dive something, it's going to take a very long time to create the highest end stuff. So you should never feel like it's a, like a dead end or like your work is is not good enough because your work is constantly evolving and it's it's always going to be that way as long as you have a career. So it, that that type of stuff is just trying to remind yourself like the, the t time is on your side always, especially as a younger person. Yeah. So um, there's always more to learn. And you, you should always just be looking forward. You should never be looking at what you did wrong or looking at how you should have retouched your images better, something like that. Just constantly be learning and always be pushing forward with your work yeah. and keeping yourself busy doing that. Absolutely. No, good advice. What uh, an old photography instructor said to me once, you're only as good as the worst thing in your portfolio. So for me, what I'm always trying to think about is what can I replace the worst thing in my portfolio with? Yeah, that's a great idea. Man, that's a good one. Yeah. got to get my portfolio updated as soon as I hang up on this call. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, uh, again, thank you so much, Kevin. This has been awesome. Yeah. And yeah, uh, if you're really great, BC, thank you. Look me up uh, and I'll do the of same course. if I'm in Arizona. Uh, sure. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Nice. Well, hey, look, man, it was so much fun talking. This was really great. And thank you're a great interviewer. Oh, it's wow. Great structure, good questions. I mean, it got me thinking about a lot of different stuff. So really appreciate it. Thanks. Appreciate it. We'll talk soon. Okay, sounds good.